Welcome to Navigating Advocacy, the true crime podcast that goes beyond storytelling to ignite change and seek justice. I'm Melissa. And I'm Whitney. As true crime enthusiasts turned passionate advocates, we've seen the power of storytelling raise awareness about unsolved crimes and bring hope to victims and their families. We hope to inspire action and promote positive change within the true crime community. Our mission is simple. We provide a platform for victims and their families to share their stories, to be heard, and find solidarity. But we don't stop there. We offer practical guidance to our listeners on how they can actively make a difference in their own communities. Together, we can create a wave of change. We're here to empower you to also become advocates for change, no matter where or who you are. We are Navigating Advocacy. Happy Monday. Happy Monday. It feels a little weird to be recording, not going to lie. I was going to say that, and I don't know why. It's not like we haven't recorded in a while. It just, it feels weird, though. Maybe because we just got back from our action-oriented advocacy trip, and it was a longer trip than we usually take. We kind of fit in a couple of projects all in one weekend, made it a little bit longer, and I still feel like I haven't recovered yet from that trip, even though we got back three days ago now. I just can't get it together this week. Okay, so maybe that's it. But it just, it feels like the first time we're recording, you know what I mean? Yeah. Or like we took a very long break, which we did not. So I'm like, what the heck is going on? But we just got to move on with it. You know, maybe Mercury's in the microwave or whatever it is they say. And yeah, I, I think that's it. Maybe things have been shifting. Yep. Or we did. What is it? We shift into the something of Aquarius. Maybe that's the whole thing. We're, it's throwing us all off. I don't know. Obviously, I'm not an astrology major <laughs> by any means. I don't really know what any of it means. But my TikTok told me some things are changing. And then maybe that's it. <laughs> <laughs> yes, that's where we like to get our info. Yeah. So, yeah, we really don't have any announcements. It's kind of just grinding work right now. Lots of things coming up in the future. But right now, it's just kind of steady. Yeah. Lots of background action right. going on over here. Yes. All right. So I'm excited to listen to your case for Kentucky. Yep. We are already in Kentucky. The disappearance of a mother of two brought me to rural Kentucky this week. Hazard, Kentucky is a city located in Perry County in the eastern part of the state. It's tucked within the Appalachian Mountains, and Hazard has a rich history closely tied to the coal mining industry. It thrived in the region for much of the 20th century. The city's name is said to have originated from the hazards associated with the difficult terrain and challenging work conditions faced by coal miners. Over the years, Hazard has undergone economic transitions diversifying its economy beyond coal. The city hosts the Hazard Community and Technical College, providing educational opportunities to the local community, and features outdoor recreational options, including Buckhorn Lake State Resort Park, which attracts visitors with its scenic beauty and diverse wildlife. Despite facing economic challenges, Hazard continues to be a resilient community with a unique cultural heritage shaped by its Appalachian roots. As with many rural areas, you see that many relationships cross over the small communities, so we'll be discussing the town of Fisty, Kentucky as well. Fisty is a small and more secluded community about 14 miles from Hazard. In fact, it's so small that it doesn't even have a Wikipedia page or its own website. You have to travel to Hazard for a local library, and the only historical information I could find was that the post office was established in 1906 and that the town was named after one of the early families to settle in the area. Fisty Sam Combs was his name. Okay, 1906. That's legit. This may go without saying, but this tiny Kentucky town did not have a local newspaper, so the coverage of this case is slim. I couldn't even get you accurate crime statistics for this area. There's little information about Natasha Fugit Jones before her disappearance. 
She was a devoted mother of two boys, which is why I clinked to her story. Her mother said that she was funny, witty, and a great person, but Natasha battled addiction. She had been attending inpatient treatment at a rehabilitation facility in Harlan, Kentucky, just over 60 miles away. She left of her own accord and went to her grandmother's house on Singleton Branch in Fisty, where her sons were living. Her grandmother said that she technically wasn't supposed to leave the rehabilitation facility, but she also wasn't going to put her out on the street. She wanted to be with her sons. She was going to let her be with her sons. Gotcha. That's who had the children was her grandmother? Yes. Okay. The morning of May 7th, 2015, while her grandmother was at a doctor's appointment, Natasha left the house. Her grandmother, Ola, wasn't too concerned because it was not uncommon for Natasha to go with friends, whether it was for a walk to hang out in the woods, to an appointment, or just hanging out for the day. When she hadn't returned that evening, Ola asked the boys to start getting ready for bed, and Natasha's oldest son found a note placed under his pillow. Natasha had left it, saying that she would be gone for two or three days to not be sad and that she was going to look for the three of them a new place to live. She never spent more than a few days away from her sons, or without checking in. When she had it returned by June 7th, Ola became concerned and reported her missing. Kentucky State Police opened an investigation and began searching. Search and rescue teams utilized dogs, helicopter searches, and on-foot teams of friends and neighbors ensued. Unfortunately, no physical evidence was ever found. Well, I'm glad they at least did that. For a woman that said she was going to be gone for a couple days, usually to me, that'd be like, oh, she just decided to stay gone longer. And this was a whole month later that she reported her missing. So a decent amount of time had passed that if she was going to stay gone at this point, she would have come back. She would have reached out to her kids. She would have called and said, hey, guys, it's going to be a little bit longer because even while she was in the rehabilitation facilities, she maintained that contact. So this was very out of character. But you are correct. Usually law enforcement, especially with adults, are like, sorry, they're adults. They're just living their life. And that's it. Which I feel like half the cases out there, some man is saying, oh, she just ran away. Middle of the night. I have no idea. Left all of her belongings. That kind of that same scenario just keeps happening and happening. Unfortunately, no physical evidence was found. As law enforcement began making pleas for public assistance, leads started rolling in. One Kentucky State Police detective told AWHAS 11 News Reporter that the phone calls were coming in constantly with tips. Hundreds of them were brought in. Law enforcement learned that a female friend had picked up Natasha that morning, and according to NamUs, she was dropped off at a reclaimed strip mine with a male acquaintance. I am choosing to not name this friend or the male acquaintance that she was left with. The friend has been very public about it. If someone wants to dig for it, you could find the information. But I'm choosing to not name her because I don't think she did anything wrong. The friend that had picked her up that morning has come forward and was interviewed by authorities after Natasha disappeared and shared all of the information she had. According to the Charlie Project, the male acquaintance said that Natasha ran into the woods and never returned, which is strange. Within the first six weeks of her disappearance, her family offered a $2,000 cash reward. Even with this incentive, the leads grew few and far in between, and Natasha's case grew cold. In 2017, renewed interest in Natasha's disappearance arose when Texas EcuSearch posted that they would be conducting a search on January 21st and 22nd if the weather allowed. Several articles mentioned this search, but none actually stated if the search actually occurred. The reward was raised to $10,000 in May of 2017 when Ola stated she wasn't giving up. She feels strongly that someone knows something and that Natasha would not abandon her children. Yes, she had left without warning in the past, but never for this long without any communication. For several years, the Where's Natasha Facebook page was the only active discussion about Natasha's disappearance. On the six-year anniversary, Ola again was interviewed by local media, offering a reward one more time. This time, it was for $15,000, but it came with a deadline, hoping to create a sense of urgency. 
Again, Natasha's family was left heartbroken and without answers. As with many small towns, the rumor mill churned out many gruesome theories. Natasha's oldest son, unfortunately, became a victim of the ugly side of social media. Many attacked his mother's addiction as the reason for her disappearance. Other rumors stated that Natasha had been murdered, and night after night, Natasha's family dream of a day when they would know where she may be. Now, almost eight years later, they are still seeking answers. If you have any information, have seen Natasha, or heard any rumors you may think is nothing, I urge you to contact Kentucky State Police. You can reach them at 606-435-6069. The active detective on the case now has publicly stated that he wonders if her grandmother hadn't have waited for a full month because of the efforts that were originally put out, if they would have found something a little bit more. It was a couple of times the dogs that they used were able to trace a little bit of a trail, but they didn't make it very far. I don't think we should put this on the grandmother, though. That's kind of harsh. Absolutely not. Absolutely not. That's something that he stated in a couple of different interviews. And it, at my, in my mind, it doesn't matter at this point. You still need to do everything you can to try and find them. Yeah, and not point fingers because she's probably just doing the best she can raising two little kids as well. And not wanting to get her granddaughter in trouble or, you know, if she was supposed to be at the facility. It's just, that's, yeah, I don't think that was needed. I found 10 to 15 different articles. Again, all the same basic information. I wish there was more out there. There's not even, there's only like three or four different actual newspaper articles. Some of them were digital articles because this, I mean, this happened in 2015. So this is a digital age is when. People used technology. Um, I just wish there was, there's was there been more done. Her grandmother feels strongly that there's someone within the community there that knows, and they're just not coming forward. So now it's time. Somebody that knows something, please call that tip line. Uh, I'm sure you can do it anonymously, but her her boys... Her boys need to know what happened. And I know this is a much shorter episode than usual, but I just couldn't have those two boys. And on top of that, they're 11. They were 11 and 8 when it happened. And mine's going to be 11 in a week. And my youngest is 8. I just couldn't let it go. I couldn't not cover it. We want to share a few ways you can support us to continue our mission. You can become a Patreon subscriber or a simple rate and review on your favorite podcast platform helps us get in front of someone who may know something. We will continue traveling state by state seeking justice because we will be there no matter where.